Hello to everyone who's joining us. Hello. So what I'm going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get I'll get started. I'm just going to share screen and get this up and running. And so, for those who don't know me, um, I'm James Gavin, also known as the Digital Philatelist. Um, and um, I'll go through. I've got a presentation, so I'm going to go through that um, now. I'll just get it up on the screen. Sweet. Um, so, that, let's have a try that again. Sweet. That should be up for everyone now. Um, so, I'm, uh, my name um, is James Gavin, as I mentioned. I'm a digital philatelist. Um, today, I'm just going to go through some of the changes in the social media world, um, some of the trends how it impacts, um, and I'll talk a bit about myself. So um, my website is uh, thedigitalphilatelist.com and obviously I'm at the portal at uh, PTS Stampex Virtual. So my background is that I started out as a publicity officer for the Rhodesian Study Circle from roughly 2013 to 2020. Um, and I ran their Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts. Um, I currently run the Digital Philatelist the point of the digital philatelist is to bring all these different social media aspects all into one place. So there's literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of accounts um, out there all dealing with philately. And I'm trying to bring them all together, centralize them, group them under themes or countries um, so that people can get to the information and the resources they want. So I don't host um, any stamp information at all that relies on clubs, blogs, websites, Instagram accounts. I'm just there to funnel it to the right place. Um, so what has changed in the philatelic world? So I'm, I have been hearing a lot that um, COVID has made changes um, to philately. Um, in part, yes, in part, no. So for a lot of traditional philatelists, so those who haven't really engaged in the social media aspect of philately, um, COVID has pushed them into new realms, such as Zoom and online meetings and virtual exhibitions. However, for the bulk of the collectors, um, it actually hasn't. They've been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years already being in that space. So what they, how they interact hasn't changed a great deal, uh, but definitely the traditional market has. So why do we need to understand why this change is important? So traditional philately, as we have known it um, over the years, really is a tip of an iceberg. But the majority of the iceberg, which is a 35 to 55 year old demographic, um, really doesn't engage with that traditional style of philately. Um, and they've, instead of engaging, they've branched out and they've created their own social hubs um, online, um, but still, you know, still enjoying stamp collecting as a hobby and promoting that amongst each other. So, what do you need to know if you're moving forward? So this is what I'm gonna go through. I'm not gonna cover every social media platform. It's just some of the main trends that are appearing that may not be on your radar or you might not even know what they're about, uh, but you have to keep your eyes on. So before I start, I will give a warning. Um, consumer habits have changed. So this means that the way that we socially, outside of the philatelic world, we're no longer um, doing what we did, especially pre-COVID, the way we buy um, has changed, the way we're going to be interacting in the future has changed, and philately is not immune to that, so they're also going to go through changes. Attention spans have also changed, so a website or any type of online media presence, you only have three to seven seconds to grab a visitor's attention. If you can't get them in three to seven seconds, they won't visit your website. If you are a club um, or an organisation, you need to have a five-year plan in place. It takes five years to build up a social media presence. So just going online straight away um, or picking up a social media platform isn't going to give you a win. You have to do it over long term. So it's not a quick win. It also requires regular attention. So that means that you have to post pretty much weekly um, in order to keep people visiting your site. Because if you leave it too long, they'll just disengage and they won't come back. So word of warning to everyone. So let's have a look at some of these trends. Uh, so the first one um, obviously is YouTube. So YouTube is probably the biggest reason pe people are visiting my website at the moment. 
in particular grab bags and unboxing videos. So that's just someone getting mail stamps that they've purchased and unboxing them live and working through them. So probably the two most popular ones that do this are Mallard Stamps and he has um, 1.4 thousand subscribers. He's been really um, picking up speed over the last few months. Um, he gets, I would say roughly about one to 200 new subscribers per month. Um, and the other one is more established, which is Ted Talk Stamps and he has 2.3 um, thousand subscribers. The other really big thing um, that takes off is philatelic supplies. Which stamp album do we use? Which um, tweezers do we use? Is there a magnifying glass we should be using? He's drawing really big numbers. So the largest YouTube account is for philately is definitely probably Exploring Stamps by Graham Beck. He has 19.6 thousand subscribers. So to give you an idea, the American Philatelic Society has around about 25,000 members. Um, he has 19.6 thousand subscribers. So he has a massive influence um, on the generation under the traditional forest. His largest video is on stamp albums with 62,000 views, <laughs> which is crazy, which means 62,000 collectors are trying to find out which stamp album they should be using to put stamps in. So YouTube is a really um, big opportunity for any philatelic trade sponsorship. And at the moment, it, it's not being used and I have no idea why. Um, nearly any YouTube channel that's not philatelic will have a sponsor. That is someone who will be plugged for 10 to 30 seconds um, or they will give products. So let's say it was stamps to the um, content maker to actually then show on their channel. No one's using this. So if you think that um, these channels like um, Exploring Stamps reaches 19.6 thousand viewers um, and even con uh, conversations with philatelists, they reach five, they've got 588 subscribers. The only people who have approached them is the American Philatelic Society. So out of all the organizations, just one. No trade, no dealers, nothing. So there's a really big um, gap there that should be used. Basically, it's the new way of advertising where we used to do in print media, it should now be through YouTube. And social media influencers can influence buying habits, which is um, another thing. So stamps that are shown on um, a lot of these videos, people will go out and buy them because they've never seen them before. The history is shown or the background and they wanna buy them. So there's a big opportunity there on YouTube. Uh, the next one that's coming up is what we call Patreon. So Patreon is basically a subscription service and it, it is designed to support artists and content makers. Um, According to Zoroa in 2019, 71% of adults across 12 countries have subscription services. So a subscription service, um, can, the most common ones would be like to Netflix or to Disney Plus. Um, they're probably big ones, but also um, pop cult, where people get boxes of pop culture, shaving products, beauty products, clothing products. Um, it's a regular patronage. So what they'll do is they'll pay a certain amount of money each month or each quarter and that business will send out a package with goods in it and it can be a whole heap of random goods so patreon offers this as a tiered service the biggest um, account at the moment and again another one that's really popular and gets a lot of airing on uh, youtube accounts is the latter lovely um, so he has 120 patrons at the moment um, he has six tiers ranging from three dollars up to $28, so roughly about a pound 60 upwards. Um, so if you're a small club or even an organization or a dealer even, and you've got a lot of common material, uh, bulk material, this is a really good way to move it because it's generally beginners to intermediate collectors who use this service um, and they're just looking to fill stamp albums. And for some reason across social media, there seems to be this huge gap for just basic material. Um, and this is where Patreon comes in really well. And this is where places like, oh, people like Flat and Lovely are doing really well. The next one is Etsy. So Etsy is an e-commerce website and it's focused on handmade um, or vintage items and craft supplies. So Etsy is a growing platform. So nearly every month I get a couple more accounts that I list on my website. Etsy has a really high representation of women. So women collectors, through both Instagram and Etsy tend to um, steer more towards arts and craft as a supplement to collecting. 
So you can see things like um, the notebooks on the side. You can see Enfield Post Christmas decorations, mini print vintage um, with the sil stamp silhouettes, which are extremely popular, um, especially in terms of gifts. Um, Tonya Gillings is a, a big media presence. She does a lot of art based around the stamp to expand the image on the stamp. And obviously we also have art stamped, um, Suzanne Ray. Um, she also is really popular on Etsy and Instagram. So this is a really good way if you do, if you're a dealer and you have bulk stamps that are all the same color or the same topic, um, you know, those, those stamps that are not really worth anything, maybe slightly damaged. This can be a really good opportunity to start moving that type of stock. Um, it's also an opportunity where you may be able to approach some of these artists and start maybe putting some of this into your inventory um, to sell because they are really, really popular. Etsy does, there is a lot of cross promotion, as I mentioned, between Etsy and Instagram. So usually if they're on Instagram, they'll have an Etsy store and they link backwards and forwards. So totally different demographic, totally different way of collecting, but really popular. The next one is Instagram. So Instagram is a video and photo sharing network um, and it's owned by Facebook. And this has actually become really popular for the teen to 30 year old demographics to show their stamp collections. So not in a formal ex exhibition, um, informal, not always filled with the most technical details, but it's how they wanna show their stamps. So you can see on, um, which I hope is gonna be your right hand side is Victory in Europe Day, that's by India Postage. So she does a lot of um, posts showing a story based on the stamps. MNT.stamp below, um, he presents his stamps really uniquely. Um, he's Persian based, um, just a different way to present them. We have Stamp Teller, which has obviously got the picture of Juan and Ava Pet on, um, and he will take images and just put them over whatever the original image is. So you can see he's got a beta over a beta. Lebanese stamps is another popular one. Um, Lebanese stamps tries to match up the topic of the stamp with some type of image. So Instagram is a really big in this space. And it, if, I, if I said to exhibition holders where to move, this would be somewhere to move towards. It's not traditional, it's not technical, but it's what the next generation is engaging with. Um, lots of stamp art, artists in this space as well. And it's got a really good demographic um, in terms of gender. So it, there's both male, female representation is really, really good. About the age, de age demographic is definitely from teens, roughly 13 to 15 year olds, all the way up to around about 30 year olds. So I'll open the floor to any questions. As I said, it was only going to be a brief one. Um, if you do have questions outside of this chat, feel free to come over to the portal, meet me at the portal with Graham Beck from Exploring Stamps and Punk Philatelist. Uh, but if there's any questions, please ask away. Yes, hi, this is Michael, Michael Perm. Um, I have a question. I have a question regarding um, where do you see the um, the the number of philatelists going uh, right now with COVID and all the digitization? There's a, I kind of feel that there's a lot of people rediscovering philately. And um, I was wondering, what do you, do you see an effect on your accounts from that? Do you see an upwards trend right now in people joining? Uh, you're subscribing to your account or or getting more chat messages requests via email or so or is is it more more or less flat since when you started um so the digital philatelist i i left the rs uh, the rhodesian study circle in june of um 2020 in terms of their um in, in the role i was doing um and i started the digital philatelist in july um, so I've had 50,000 visits during that period to the web, just my website. And that's not including the other social media accounts that I have. Um, the thing is, is that these collectors are out there. They just don't, they're not going to engage how we would like them to engage. They're not going to join clubs and they're not going to join societies. It's not how they work. Um, they create their own clubs, their own societies by their own content. Um, I I really don't see that COVID has changed them at all. In terms of people coming back to the hobby, yeah, definitely COVID has 
done that. We have seen that across social media platforms where people have rediscovered it. And what they've done is they haven't connected with the club or society, they've connected with social media. So when they see social media and they're seeing videos posted, Twitter accounts, Instagram and that, um, it's exciting to them because it's what they're used to as how this, the, this generation is engaging um, socially. So they get right back into it and, and they just like, it's totally changed for them. However, if they were to go to a club or a society, I think they would just kind of see what they probably were used to as a kid. And that's that's a bit of a friction. I hope right. that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Any other questions at all? Feel free to ask. Hi James, Jason Burniston here. Uh, I'm just I'm just curious as to if you're wanting to sort of engage with with the, these collectors in these different platforms, is it mm. that is it that you join these platforms, you know, as an organisation or as a dealer, or is it that you you kind of try to bring links to these platforms into yours? You have to have a presence. So yeah, you're going to need to get familiar with whatever demographic. So you kind of have to work out what is the demographic doing now and where is it going to be in five years' time? So this is why I always make a, a statement that you need to plan five years. So part of what you do on social media is always to bring the person back to your website. Websites are critical. Your website has to be modern. It has to be um, easily accessible and you have to be able to bring them back there. So even if you're on Twitter... Um, you know, where you can socially engage with a lot of collectors, thousands of collectors, you've got to get them back to your website and you've got to give them a reason to come back to your website. Because if they go there, you've got three to seven seconds to convert them over to be a regular visitor. And that's hard, um, unless you're regularly posting on Twitter, keeping your content up to date. Um, yeah. So a lot of clubs and societies, I feel, sit back and wait for members to come to them. Um, or, and even, I guess, dealers a little bit um, you know they've been established for so many years they're waiting for people to come they're not going to come that way it, it, it's people don't work that way anymore you have to tell them why they need to come give them a reason okay thank you james you're welcome any other questions at all feel free to ask Hi James, this is Taufik from the chat previously. I was wondering what was your main motive to start the digital flex list? Sure. Um, nice to see you here. Um, so right. I think I think one of the reasons I started it, um, because of the work I was doing on the Rhodesian study circle, um, I was connecting with I was a, I was connecting the Rhodesian circle with um, groups on Facebook that weren't even dealing with philately, um, but then seeing that there were philatelists in these groups, but they just, they, they, they were almost introverted philatelists. Um, and so the other thing I saw as well, connecting with other groups is that they're not always visible. People don't know what's out there. Um, and I think that's half the problem with social media in the traditional organisation's eyes is they don't they can't see this. Um, they don't see this because either they're not engaged or it's just not visible to them. So what I wanted to do is really bring all that together, um, funnel these, um, whether it's a topic or a country, funnel all these groups and accounts together so that if people come to my website and they look for something like um, Orange Free State, they can go, do I want to interact with them on Facebook? Do I want to, want to interact via website? Do I want to hang out at the Twitter account? They've got the options based on what's available at the moment that I, could, that I can find. <laughs> things still pop up. Really weird things pop up when I look for things that I'm not looking for. Yeah, I truly agree on the way we are socialising digitally because I, on this age, and there's not that many people collecting stamps, so that it's kind of hard to find people who collect stamps these days. So I find, I find places like Instagram and Twitter 
a very nice place to socialize and to gain my knowledge. And I think yeah. the digital world has actually changed me on my view of countries all because of stamps. So I was actually very, uh, let's say I'm very grateful for it, to meeting a lot of new people because it's not every day you get to chat with somebody from India or from Iran. It's a very, it's a very great place in my opinion. And, so, and I think people should join the digital flatly world, world more because I have actually have a few friends who joined Instagram because of Letly and some with post crossing. So I'm kind of grateful for that as well, because I'm also trying to spread the world that Letly is still a good, is still a good hobby and stuff like that. So yeah. And sometimes I will also bring a few stamps to school and none of, I expect them to be like, oh, you, you collect stamps, that's boring. But actually, I found out that a lot of people are very interested in them because I would tell like his, the history and background and even presented some of them to my classes a few times. Like in history class, it was during, it was pre-Malaysian independence. I actually showed a few stamps and then the teacher was very interested and so were few my friends. So I actually feel very happy that at least people don't find stamps boring anymore because they still hold that historic value. So yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Like um, I have friends and, you know, you know, for whatever reason, I'll bring up, I'm, I'm a stamp collector, you know, and I'm happy geek to be a stamp collector. Um, and the next minute, it's a half an hour to hour conversation about what I collect. <laughs> and they're like, oh, oh, and what about this? And what about that? So um, I was on, I was with Mallard Stamps um, on his Twitter account the other day and he was looking at a, a Polish uh, postcard. I think it was a prisoner of war postcard from World War I, uh, but he couldn't read it. So my mate speaks Polish. So I sent it to him. My mate just gave me a whole history um, of why this wasn't Polish, but it was in, it's in current Poland and it's really Prussia. And, and it was like, wow, you know, the stories are what draws people in. And that's what I found with the Radiation Study Circle. It's not always the stamps. It's the story that comes with it. Um, so, but it's great. I know that, um, I think you mentioned that you were part of the Discord server. So if anyone doesn't know what Discord is, it's basically an online chat platform and it's mainly for gamers. Um, computer gamers, but there's actually a dedicated uh, computer, uh, like a dedicated philately channel on there. And it's a younger crowd and it's really popular. So it is on my website. So if you're not sure about Discord or, you know, how to get to it, it's on my website, just under Discord, um, but it's a really, really good um, group for- It's a really younger, nice place like to ask people. questions and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a really great, there are a great lot of people there. Hmm. All right, thank you, James, for the nice, for the nice chat. Not a problem. We'll chat. I'll meet you back at the portal soon. Uh -huh, I'll meet you there as well. Cool. Is there any other questions anyone had on any aspects of digital philately? Oh, and James, sorry, I, ha I have another question, actually. That's okay. Would you, would you consider that Belletley changed your life? It was definitely influential uh, because I collected British Commonwealth when I was a teenager. Um, I knew a lot of, um, about countries that didn't exist or what the current, um, you know, country names or what they are. I, I, I knew that where other people it, at my school would have no idea what I was talking about. Um, when I was collect, as I've collected Rhodesia, I can have a conversation about Zimbabwe and its history and Malawi and its history with a lot of people um, that would have, no, I would have no idea where the country is to start with or those countries um, or their history or some of the richness of that history. Um, so yeah, it's definitely shaped my life without a doubt. And I think it's, you know, once you find how, once you collect your way, once you find out what interests you and how you want to collect and you pursue that, you just open up so much knowledge um, that can take you places, whether it's research or, you know, 
organization, uh, which sometimes I lack, uh, you know, it, it, it'll give you skills that you sometimes don't even know you're, you're getting. So definitely 100%. It's, it shaped my life. Yeah, I believe that philately also, also changed my life. But originally, I started to collect coins in the past. When I was nine years old, I collected coins and stamps. And I also collected a few banknotes because back then I was very interested in geography and the world. Actually, I think my first interest on geography started with flags. I remember when I was five years old, there was this book at a bookstore that had shown all of these flags. And I've always begged my mother and father to buy that book. So yeah, that is a it's a wide it has widened my knowledge about geography and has made me more interactive with people because in the past I wasn't that much of a of a sociable person. I would just mainly play games and stuff like that, which I found unproductive, as you know, as kids these days, they always play games. I played then, a lot of games <laughs> as a teenager. <laughs> yeah, everyone played games. But I was games and stamps, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah because in the past my father was actually quite strict with me because mm -hmm. he would like he, he you know his parents they always like what's the word they always like force you to study and stuff like that to get good grades you know asian yeah, parents definitely, yeah definitely your cultural background i was gonna say um <laughs> you, like we get a lot of that in, like in australia people of asian descent yeah let us know about that so yeah, but a lot of people do move from, it's, it is funny, like you mentioned, because a lot of people do move from uh, collecting coins into stamps and sometimes vice versa, but I usually find it's vice versa later in life. But I think I find stamps is a cheaper, is a cheaper option <laughs> than coins because coins are very expensive some, at times. Hmm. Yeah. And then yeah. especially banknotes, the game is started on banknotes. But yeah, banknotes bank are also a quite interesting subject as well. But yeah, stamps are like very easy to obtain and they're very easy to observe. And there's a whole community online where you can interact and ask questions about them. So yeah, yeah. That's what, I used to be mainly coins, but now I'm mainly stamps because I have like a ton of stamps, but I rarely get to find coins these days because mm. they are very hard to find. And I, as I don't I think, live near a dealer. Yeah, even at, when I was like, I was a teenager, we like, eBay didn't come in until I was in my late teens. Um, and prior to that, like I used to get an approvals book and that's about as close as I got to a stamp dealer. And I mean, the generations now, they can go literally anywhere to get stamps. They can go to Facebook groups. They can go, you know, even Instagram and Twitter, there's sellers on there. Um, so, you know, there's, and a lot of the stuff is a lot cheaper because it wasn't as readily available. So I think when you, like, if you pick a country, it, it doesn't matter where you pick it now, you can get really good material um, cheap to fill up collections, which I think is amazing. Yeah, but to be <laughs> I honest, don't know how big my uh, collection would have been. I, if I go on eBay and buy some stamps, to be honest, mm -hmm. the prices scares me. Even though if it's like something like three US dollars or maybe five quid, it still can mm -hmm. be quite scary as a teenager who still yeah, doesn't yeah, have a, lot a salary. Of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money, which is why I mainly just buy lots. So I can just yeah. discover what I can find and make good use and out of it. And lots of lots of really good, as I um, was saying earlier, Mallard stamps. He just has, I don't know, it, he has this box. It's, I'm just going to call it a magical box. Um, and he just pulls, like he 